Book Two, Chapter Eight of the Fatal Three by Mary Elizabeth Braddon. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Eight, Not Proven. Mildred stood speechless for some moments after those words of Castellani's, looking at him with kindling eyes. How dare you? She cried at last. How dare you accuse my husband, the noblest of men? the noblest of men do strange things sometimes upon an evil impulse and when they are not quite right here touching his forehead my husband george greswold is too high a mark for your malignity do you think you can make me believe evil of him after fourteen years of married life his intellect is the clearest and the soundest i have ever found in man or woman you can no more shake my faith in his power of brain than in his goodness of heart perhaps not the george greswold you know is a gentleman of commanding intellect and unblemished character but the george ransom whom i knew seventeen years ago was a gentleman who was shrewdly suspected of having made away with his wife and who was confined in a public asylum in the environs of nice as a dangerous lunatic if you doubt these facts you have only to go to nice or to st jean where mr ransom and his wife lived for some time in a turtle-dove retirement which ended tragically seventeen years does not obliterate the evidence of such a tragedy as that in which your husband was chief actor i do not believe one word and i hope i may never hear your voice again said mildred with her hand on the electric bell she did not remove her hand till her servant the courier opened the door a look told him his duty castellani took up his hat without a word and albrecht deferentially attended him to the landing and politely whistled for the lift to convey him to the vestibule below castellani made the descent feeling like lucifer when he fell from heaven too soon he muttered to himself she took the cards out of my hands she forced my play and spoiled my game but i have given her something to think about she will not forget to-day's interview in a hurry albrecht the handiest of men was standing beside him working the lift where is your next move to be albrecht he asked in german the noble-born lady had not yet decided albrecht told him but he thought the move would be either to venice or to posilipo if i pretended to be a prophet albrecht i should tell thee that the honourable lady will go neither to venice nor posilipo but that thy next move will be to the riviera perhaps to nice albrecht shrugged his shoulders in polite indifference look here my friend come thou to me when madame gives the order for nice and i will give thee a louis for assuring me that i prophesied right said castellani as he stepped out of the lift mildred walked up and down the room trying to control the confusion of her thoughts trying to reason calmly upon that hideous accusation which she had affected to despise but which yet had struck terror to her soul would he dare to bring such a charge villain and traitor as he was if there were not some ground for the accusation some glimmer of truth amidst a cloud of falsehood and her husband's manner his refusal to tell her the history of his first marriage his reticence his secrecy reticence so out of harmony with his boldly truthful nature the gloom upon his face when she forced him to speak of that past life all these things came back upon her with an appalling force and even trifles assumed a direful significance oh my beloved what was that dark story and why did you leave me to hear it from such false lips as those and then with passionate tears she thought how easy it would have been to forgive and pity even a tale of guilt unpremeditated guilt doubtless fatality rather than crime if her husband had laid his weary head upon her breast and told her all holding back nothing confident in the strength of a great love to understand and to pardon how much easier would it have been to bear the burden of a guilty secret so shared in the same trustfulness of her husband's love how light a burden compared with this which was laid upon her this horror of groping backward into the black night of the past i must know the worst she said to herself i will test that scoundrel's accusation i must know all i will take no step to injure my dear love i will seek no help trust no friend i must act alone then came a more agonizing thought of the hapless wife the victim my sister what was your fate i must know her thoughts came back always to that point i must know all she recalled the image of that unacknowledged sister 
the face bending over her bed when she started up out of a feverish dream frightened and in tears to take instant comfort from that loving presence to fling her arms round fay's neck and nestle upon her bosom never had that sisterly love failed her the quiet watcher was always near a sigh a faint little murmur and the volunteer nurse was at her side often on waking she had found fay sitting by her bed in the dead of the night motionless and watchful sleepless from loving care her love for fay had been one of the strongest feelings of her life she who had been ever dutiful to the frivolous capricious mother had yet unconsciously given a stronger affection to the companion who had loved her with an unselfish love which the mother had never shown her regard for fay had been the one romance of her childhood and had continued the strongest sentiment of her mind until the hour when for the first time she knew the deeper love of womanhood and gave her heart to george greswold and now these two supreme affections rose up before her in dreadful conflict and in the sister so faithfully loved and so fondly regretted she saw the victim of her still dearer husband pamela's footsteps and pamela's voice in the corridor startled her in the midst of those dark thoughts she hurriedly withdrew to her own room where the maid louisa was sitting intent upon one of those infinitesimal repairs which served as an excuse for her existence go and tell miss ransom that i cannot dine with her my headache is worse than it was when she went out ask her to excuse me louisa obeyed and mildred locked the door upon her grief she sat all through the long evening brooding over the past and the future impatient to know the worst she was on her way to genoa with pamela and their attendants before the following noon albrecht the courier had scarcely time to claim the promised coin from mr castellani miss ransom repined at this sudden departure just as we are going to be engaged she sobbed when she and mildred were alone in the railway compartment it is really unkind of you to whisk one off in such a way aunt my dear pamela you have had a lucky escape and i hope you will never mention mr castellani's name again he is an utterly bad man how cruel to say such a thing behind his back too what has he done that is so bad i should like to know i cannot enter into details but i can tell you one thing pamela he has never had any idea of asking you to be his wife he told me that in the plainest language do you mean to say that you question him about his feelings for me i did what i felt was my duty pamela my duty to you and to your uncle duty ejaculated pamela with such an air that box began to growl imagining his mistress in want of protection duty it is the most hateful word in the whole of the english language you asked him when he was going to propose to me you lowered and humiliated me beyond all that words can say you you spoilt everything pamela is this reasonable or just to be asked when he was going to propose to a girl with his artistic temperament the very thing to disgust him said pamela in a series of gasps if you had wanted to part us for ever you could not have gone to work better whatever i wanted yesterday i am quite clear about my feelings to-day pamela it is my earnest hope that you and mr castellani will never meet again you are very cruel then heartless inhuman because you have done with love because you have left my poor uncle george heaven alone knows why is no one else to be happy you could not be happy with cesar castellani pamela happiness does not lie that way i tell you again he is a bad man and i tell you again i don't believe you in what way is he bad does he rob murder forge set fire to people's houses what has he done that is bad he has traduced your uncle to me his wife pamela's countenance fell you-you may have misunderstood him she faltered no there was no possibility of mistake he slandered my husband he let me see in the plainest way that he had no real regard for you that he did not care how far his frequent visits compromised either you or me he is utterly base pamela a man without rectitude or conscience he would have clung to us like some poisonous burr if i had not shaken him off my dear dear child said mildred putting her arm round pamela's reluctant waist and drawing the girlish figure nearer to her side to the relief of box who leaped upon their shoulders and licked their faces in a rapture of sympathetic feeling my dear you have been treated very badly but i am not to blame 
you have had a lucky escape pamela why be angry about it it is all very well to talk like that sighed the girl wrinkling her white forehead in painful perplexity he was my daydream one cannot renounce one's daydream at a moment's warning if you knew the castles i have built a life spent with him a life devoted to the cultivation of art he would have made my voice and we could have had a flat in queen anne's mansions and a brougham in victoria and lived within our income concluded pamela following her own train of thought my dearest there are so many worthier to share your life you will have new daydreams perhaps when i am sixty it will take me a lifetime to forget him do you think i could marry a country bumpkin or any one who was not artistic you shall not be asked to marry a rustic the artistic temperament is common enough nowadays almost every one is artistic pamela shrugged her shoulders petulantly and turned to the window in token that she had had her say she grieved like a child who has been disappointed of some jaunt looked forward to for long days of expectation she tried to think herself ill-used by her uncle's wife and yet that common sense of which she possessed a considerable share told her that she had only herself to blame she had chosen to fall in love with a showy versatile adventurer without waiting for evidence that he cared for her proud in the strength of her position as an independent young woman with a handsome fortune and a fairly attractive person she had imagined that mr castellani could look no higher hope for nothing better than to obtain her hand and heart she had ascribed his reticence to delicacy she had accepted his frequent visits as an evidence of his attachment and of his ulterior views and now she sat in a sulky attitude coiled up in a corner of the carriage with her face to the window meditating upon her fool's paradise for seven happy weeks she had seen the man who admired her almost daily and her own intense sympathy with him had made her imagine an equal sympathy on his part when their hands touched the thrilling vibration seemed mutual and yet it had been on her side only poor fool she told herself now abased in her own self-consciousness drinking the cup of humiliation to the dregs he had slandered her uncle yes that was villainy that was iniquity she began to think that he was utterly black she remembered how coldly cruel he had been about the anemone hunt yesterday how deaf to her girlish hints never offering his company colder crueller than marble she felt as if she had squandered her love upon satan yet she was not the less angry with mildred that kind of interference was unpardonable she arrived at genoa worn out with a fatiguing journey and in worse temper than she had ever sustained for so long a period she whose worst tempers hitherto had been like april showers mildred had reciprocated her silence and box had been the only animated passenger the clever courier had made all his arrangements by telegraph they spent a night at genoa drove round the city next morning explored churches palaces and picture galleries and went on to nice in the afternoon they arrived at the great bustling station late in the evening and were driven to one of the hotels on the promenade des anglais where all preparations had been made for their reception a glowing hearth in a spacious drawing-room opening on to a balcony lamps and candles lighted roses on all the tables maid and man on the alert to receive travellers of distinction so far as a place which is not home can put on an aspect of homeliness the hotel had succeeded but mildred looked round upon the white and gold walls and the satin fauteuils with an aching heart remembering those old rooms at enderby and the familiar presence that had first made them dear to her before the habit of years had made those inanimate things a part of her life she was at nice she had taken the slanderer's advice and had gone to the city by the sea to try and trace out for herself the mystery of the past to violate her husband's secret kept so long and so closely only to rise up after years of happiness like a murdered corpse exhumed from a forgotten grave she was here on the scene of her husband's first marriage and for three or four days she walked and drove about the strange busy place aimlessly hopelessly no nearer the knowledge of that dark history than she had been at enderby manor not for worlds would she injure the man she loved she wanted to know all but the knowledge must be obtained in such a way as could not harm him this necessitated diplomacy which was foreign to her nature and patience in which womanly quality she excelled she had learnt patience in her tender ministrations to a fretful invalid during those sad slow years in which pretty mrs fawcett had faded into the grave yes she had learned to be patient and to submit to sorrow she knew how to wait the place 
delightful as it was in the early spring weather possessed no charms for her its gaiety and movement jarred upon her the sunsets were as lovely here as at palanza and her only pleasure was to watch that ever-varying splendour of declining day behind the long dark promontory of antibes or to see the morning dawn in a flush of colour above the white lighthouse yonder at the point of the peninsula of st jean it was in the village of st jean that george greswold had lived with his first wife with pay the bright face pale yet brilliant a face in which light took the place of colour the eager eyes the small sharp features and thin sarcastic lips rose up before her with the thought of that union he must have loved her she was so bright so interesting so full of vivid fancies and changeful emotions to this hour mildred remembered her fascination her power over a child's heart pamela was dull and out of spirits not all the tofnitz novels in galignani's shop could interest her she pronounced nice distinctly inferior to brighton declined even the distraction of the opera music would only make me miserable she exclaimed petulantly i wish i might never hear any again that hateful band in the gardens tortures me every morning this was not hopeful mildred was sorry for her but too deeply absorbed by her own griefs to be altogether sympathetic she will find some one else to admire before long she thought somewhat bitterly girls who fall in love so easily are easily consoled she had been at nice more than a week and had made no effort yearning to know more to know all yet dreading every new revelation she had to goad herself to action to struggle against the weight of a great fear the fear that she might find the slanderer's accusations confirmed instead of being refuted her first step was a very simple one easy enough from a social point of view among old lady castle connell's intimate friends had been a certain irish chieftain called the o'labacolly the o'labacolly's daughter had been one of the reigning beauties of dublin castle had appeared for three seasons in london with considerable eclat and in due course had married a scotch peer who was lord of an extensive territory in the highlands strictly entailed and of a more profitable estate in the neighbourhood of glasgow at his own disposal lord lochinvar had been laid at rest in the sepulchre of his forebears and lady lochinvar was a rich widow still handsome and still young enough to enjoy all the pleasures of society she had no children of her own but she had a favourite nephew whom she had adopted and who acted as her escort in her travels which were extensive and as her steward in the management of the glasgow property which had been settled upon her at marriage the highland territory had gone with a title to a distant cousin of lady lochinvar's husband mildred remembered that castellani had spoken of meeting mr ransom and his wife at lady lochinvar's palace at nice her first step therefore was to make herself known to lady lochinvar who had wintered in this fair white city ever since she came there as a young widow twenty years ago and had bought for herself a fantastic villa built early in the century by an italian prince on the crest of a hill commanding the harbour with this view she wrote to lady lochinvar recalling the old friendship between the olabacoli and lady castle connell and introducing herself on the strength of that friendship lady lochinvar responded with hibernian warmth she called at the hotel westminster that afternoon and not finding mrs greswold at home left a note inviting her to lunch at the palais montano next day mildred promptly accepted the invitation she was anxious to be alone with lady lochinvar and there seemed a better chance of a tete-a-tete -tete at the lady's house than at the hotel where it would have been difficult to exclude pamela she drove to that fair hill on the eastward side of the city turning her back upon the quaint old italian town with its narrow streets of tall white houses with red roofs and its cathedral dome embedded in the midst the red and yellow tiles glistening in the sunlight the two small horses toiled slowly up the height with the great lumbering landau carrying mildred nearer and nearer to the bright blue sky and the snow line glittering on the edge of the distant hills they went past villas and flower gardens hedges of yellow roses and hedges of coral-hued geranium cactus and agave palms and orange trees shining maiolica tubs and white marble balustrades statues and fountains oriel windows and italian cupolas turrets and towers of every order while the sapphire sea dropped lower and lower beneath the chalky winding road as the jutting promontory that shelters villefranche from the east came nearer and nearer above the blue the italian prince who built the palais montano had aspired after oriental rather than classic beauty his house was long and low with two ranges of moorish windows and a dome at each end 
there was an open loggia on the first floor with a balustrade of white and coloured marble there was a gallery above the spacious tessellated hall screened by carved sandalwood lattices behind which the beauties of a harem might be supposed to watch the entrances and exits below the house was fantastic but fascinating the garden was the growth of more than half a century and was supremely beautiful lady lochinvar received the stranger with a cordiality which would have set mildred thoroughly at her ease under happier circumstances as it was she was too completely engrossed by the object of her visit to feel any of the shyness which a person of retiring disposition might experience on such an occasion she was grave and preoccupied and it was with an effort that she responded to lady lochinvar's allusions to the past your mother and i were girls together said the dowager at dear old castle connell my father's place was within a drive of the castle but away from the river and one of my first pleasant memories is of your grandfather's gardens and the broad bright shannon what a river when i look at our stony torrent beds here and remember that glorious shannon yet you like nice better than county limerick of course i do my dear mrs greswold ireland is a delicious country to remember i saw a good deal of your mother in london before his lordship's death but after i became a widow i went very little into english society i had found english people so narrow-minded i only endured them for lochinvar's sake and after his death i became a rover i have an apartment in the champs elysees and a pied in rome and now and then when i want to drink a draught of commonplace when i want to know what the hard-headed practical british intellect is making of the world in general i give myself a fortnight at claridge's a fortnight is always enough so you see i have had no opportunity of looking up old friends i never remember seeing you in upper parchment street said mildred my dear you were a baby at the time i knew your mother i think you were just able to toddle across the drawing-room the day i bade her good-bye before i went to scotland with lochinvar our last journey poor dear man he died the following winter the butler announced luncheon and they went into an ideal dining-room purely oriental with hangings of a dull pale pink damask interwoven with lustreless gold its only ornaments old road salvers shining with prismatic hues its furniture of cedar inlaid with ivory i am quite alone to-day said lady lochinvar my nephew is driving to monte carlo by the cornice and will not be back till dinner-time i am very glad to be alone with you lady lochinvar i feel myself bound to tell you that i had an arrière-pensée in seeking your acquaintance pleasant as it is to me to meet any friend of my mother's youth lady lochinvar looked surprised and even a little suspicious she began to fear some uncomfortable story this sad-looking woman such a beautiful face but with such unmistakable signs of unhappiness a runaway wife perhaps a poor creature who had fallen into disgrace and who wanted lady lochinvar's help to regain her position or face her calumniators some awkward business no doubt lady lochinvar was generous to a fault but she liked showing kindness to happy people she wanted smiling faces and serenity about her she had never known any troubles of her own worse than losing the husband whom she had married for his wealth and position and saw no reason why she should be plagued with the troubles of other people her handsome countenance hardened ever so little as she answered is there any small matter in which i can be of service to you she began it is not a small matter it is a great matter to to a friend of mine interrupted mildred faltering a little in her first attempt at dissimulation lady lochinvar breathed more freely i shall be charmed to help your friend if i can the butler came in and out assisted by another servant as the conversation went on but as his mistress spoke to him and to his subordinate only in italian mildred concluded they understood very little english and did not concern herself about their presence i want you to help me with your recollection of the past lady lochinvar you were at nice seventeen years ago i believe between november and april yes i have spent those months here for the last twenty years you remember a mr ransom and his wife seventeen years ago yes i remember them distinctly i cannot help remembering them have you ever met mr ransom since that time never and you have not heard anything about him no 
i have never heard of him since he left the asylum on the road to st andre good heavens mrs greswold how white you have turned pietro some brandy this moment no no i am quite well only a little shocked that is all i had heard that mr ransom was out of his mind at one time but i did not believe my informant it is really true then he was once mad yes he was mad unless it was all a sham a clever assumption why should he have assumed madness lady lochinvar shrugged her portly shoulders and lifted her finely arched eyebrows with a little foreign air which had grown upon her in foreign society to escape from a very awkward dilemma he was arrested on suspicion of having killed his wife the evidence against him was weak but the circumstances of the poor thing's death were very suspicious how did she die she threw herself or she was thrown from a cliff on the other side of the promontory which you may see from that window mildred was silent for some moments while her breath came and went in hurried gasps might she not have fallen accidentally she faltered that would have been hardly possible it was a place where she had been in the habit of walking for weeks a path which anybody might walk upon in the daylight without the slightest danger and the calamity happened in broad day she could not have fallen accidentally either she threw herself over or he pushed her over in a moment of ungovernable anger she was a very provoking woman and had a tongue which might goad a man to fury i saw a good deal of her the winter before her death she was remarkably clever and she amused me i had a kind of liking for her and i used to let her tell me her troubles what kind of troubles oh they all began and ended in one subject she was jealous intolerably jealous of her husband suspected him of inconstancy to herself if he was commonly civil to a handsome woman she watched him like a lynx and did her utmost to make his life a burden to him yet loved him passionately all the time in her vehement wrong-headed manner poor girl poor girl murmured mildred with a stifled sob and then she asked with intense earnestness but lady lochinvar you who knew george ransom surely you never suspected him of murder i don't know mrs greswold i believe he was a gentleman and a man of an open generous nature but upon my word i should be sorry to pledge myself to a positive belief in his innocence as to his wife's death who can tell what a man might do harassed and tormented as that man may have been by that woman's tongue i know what pestilential things she could say what scorpions and adders dropped out of her mouth when she was in her jealous fits and she may have gone just one step too far walking by his side upon that narrow path and he may have turned upon her exasperated to madness and one push and the thing was done the edge of a cliff must be an awful temptation under such circumstances added lady lochinvar solemnly i am sure i would not answer for myself in such a situation i will answer for him said mildred firmly you know him then yes i know him where is he what is he doing has he prospered in life yes and no he was a happy man or seemed to be happy for thirteen years of married life and then god's hand was stretched out to afflict him and his only child was snatched away he married again then yes he married a second wife fourteen years ago forgive me lady lochinvar for having suppressed the truth till now i wanted you to answer me more freely than you might have done had you known all george ransom is my husband he assumed the name of greswold when he succeeded to his mother's property then mr greswold your husband is my old acquaintance is he here with you no i have left him perhaps for ever on account of that past story no for another reason which is my sad secret and his a family secret it involves no blame to him or me it is a dismal fatality which parts us you cannot suppose lady lochinvar that i could think my husband a murderer a murderer no i do not believe any one ever thought him guilty of deliberate murder but that he lost his temper with that unhappy girl spurned her from him flung her over the edge of the cliff oh no 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 it is not possible i know him too well 
he is not capable of a brutal act even under the utmost exasperation no irritation no sense of injury could bring about such a change in his nature think lady lochinvar i have been his wife for fourteen years i must know what his character is like you know what he is in happy circumstances with an attached and confiding wife you cannot imagine him goaded to madness by an unreasonable hot-headed woman you remember he was mad for half a year after his wife's death there must have been some sufficient reason for his madness his wife's wretched death and the fact that he was accused of having murdered her were enough to make him mad and then mildred remembered how she had tortured her husband by her persistent questions about that terrible past how in her jealousy of an unknown rival she too had goaded him almost as that first wife had goaded him she recalled the look of pain the mute protest against her cruelty and she hated herself for the selfishness of her love lady lochinvar was kind and sympathetic she was not angry at the trap that had been set for her i can understand she said you wanted to know the worst and you felt that i should be reticent if i knew you were mr ransom's wife well i have said all the evil i can say about him remember i know nothing except what other people thought and suspected there was an inquiry about the poor thing's death before the juge d'instruction at villefranche and mr ransom was kept in prison between the first and second inquiry and then it was discovered that the poor fellow had gone off his head and he was taken to the asylum he had no relations in the neighbourhood nobody interested in looking after him his acquaintances in nice knew very little about him or his wife even when they were living at an hotel on the promenade des anglais and going into society after they left nice they lived in seclusion at st jean and avoided all their acquaintance mrs ransom's health was a reason for retirement but it may not have been the only reason there was no one therefore to look after the poor man and his misfortunes he was just hustled away to the madhouse the inquiry fell through for want of evidence and for six months george ransom was buried alive i was in paris at the time and only heard the story when i came back to nice in the following november nobody could tell me what had become of mr ransom and it was only by accident that i heard of his confinement in the asylum some time after he had been released as a sane man did his wife ever talk to you of her own history Never she was very fond of talking to me about her husband's supposed inconstancy and the mistake she had made in marrying a man who had never cared for her but about her own people and her own antecedents she was silent as the grave in a place like nice where everybody is idle there is sure to be a good deal of gossip and we all had our own ideas about mrs ransom we put her down as a natural daughter of some person of importance or at any rate of good means she had her own fortune and was entirely independent of her husband who was not a rich man at the time no it was his mother's death that made him rich but you did not think he had married for money no our theory was that he had been worried into marrying her we thought the lady had thrown herself at his head and that all her unhappiness sprang from her knowledge that she had in a measure forced him to marry her do you remember the name of the house at st jean where they lived when they left nice yes i called there once but as mrs ransom never returned my call i concluded that they wished to drop their niece acquaintance and i heard afterwards that they were living like hermits in a cave the house is a low white villa spread out along the edge of a grassy ridge with a broad stone terrace on one side and a garden and orchard on the other it is called le bout du monde i am very grateful to you lady lochinvar for having been frank with me i will go and look at the house where they lived i may find some one perhaps who knew them you want to make further inquiries i want to find some one who is as convinced of my husband's guiltlessness as i am that will be difficult there was very little evidence for or against him the husband and wife went out to walk together one april afternoon they left the house in peace and amity as it seemed to their servants but some ladies who met and talked to them an hour afterwards thought by mrs ransom's manner that she was on bad terms with her husband when she was next seen she was lying at the foot of a cliff dead that is all that is known of the tragedy you could hardly hang a man or acquit him upon such evidence it is a case of not proven End of chapter eight
book two chapter nine of the fatal three by mary elizabeth braddon this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter nine looking back lady lochinvar offered to drive mrs greswold to st jean that afternoon her villa was half way between nice and villefranche and half an hour's drive would have taken them to the bout du monde but mildred preferred to make her explorations alone there was too much heartache in such an investigation to admit of sympathy or companionship you are all goodness to me dear lady lochinvar she said and i may come to you again for help before i have done but i would rather visit the scene of my husband's tragedy alone quite alone you cannot tell how sad the story is to me even apart from my love for him i may be able to confide in you more fully some day perhaps lady lochinvar kissed her at parting she did not care for commonplace troubles she could not sympathize with stupid family quarrels or shortness of money or any of the vulgar trivialities about which people worry their friends but a romantic sorrow a tragedy with a touch of mystery in it was full of interest for her and then mildred was a graceful sufferer not hysterical or tiresome in any way i will do anything in the world that i can for you she said will you let me bring my husband's niece to see you asked mildred she has a dull time with me poor girl and i think you would like her she shall come to me this evening if she has nothing better to do said lady lochinvar i am fond of young people and will do my best to amuse her i will send my carriage for her at half past seven that is more than kind i shall be glad for the poor girl to get a glimpse of something brighter than our perpetual tete-a-tete -tete. but there is one thing i ought to speak about before you see her i think you know something of an italian called castellani a man who is both musical and literary yes i have heard of mr castellani's growing fame he is the author of that delightful story nepenthe is he not i knew him years ago it was in the same winter we have been talking about he used to come to my parties do you know him he has been a visitor at enderby my husband's house and i have seen something of him in italy of late i am sorry to say he has made a very strong impression upon my niece's heart or upon her imagination but as i know him to be a worthless person i am deeply anxious that her liking for him should die a natural death i understand interrupted lady lochinvar you may be sure i will not encourage the young lady to talk about mr castellani mildred explained her responsibility with regard to pamela and the young lady's position with its substantial attraction for the adventurer in search of a wife she had deemed it her duty to confide thus much in lady lochinvar lest castellani should change his tactics and pursue pamela with addresses which might be only too readily accepted she left the palais montano at two o'clock and drove round the bay to st jean where the rose hedges were in flower and where the gardens were bright with bloom under a sky which suggested an english june she left the fly at the little inn where the holiday people go to eat bouillabaisse on sundays and fete days but which was silent and solitary to-day and then walked slowly along the winding road looking for the bout du monde the place was prettier and more rustic after an almost english fashion than any spot she had seen since she left enderby villas and cottages were scattered in a desultory way upon different levels under the shelter of precipitous cliffs and on every bit of rising ground and in every hollow there were orange and lemon groves with here and there a peach or a cherry in full bloom and here and there a vivid patch of flowers and here and there a wall covered with the glowing purple of bougainvilliers great caruba trees rose tall and dark amidst all this brightness and through every opening in the foliage the changeful colour of the mediterranean shone in the distance like the jasper sea of the apocalypse mildred went slowly along the dusty road looking at all the villas lingering here and there at a garden gate and asking any intelligent-looking person who passed to direct her to the bout du monde it was not till she had made the inquiry a half a dozen times that she obtained any information but at last she met with a bright-faced market-woman tramping home with empty baskets after a long morning at nice and white with the dust of the hillside le bout du monde but that was the villa where the poor young english lady lived whose husband threw her over the cliff said the woman cheerily the proprietor changed the name of the house next season for fear people should fancy it was haunted if the story got about it is called montfleury now is there any one living there mildred asked no it was let last year to an english family 
oh but an amiable family rich ah but richissime who had bought flowers in heaps of the speaker but they had left malheureusement they had returned to their property near london a great and stupendous property in a district which the flower woman described as the cremuel rod there had never been such a family in st jean five english servants three english mees who mounted on horseback daily a benefaction for the whole village now alas there was no one living at montfleury but an old woman in charge could you take me to the house asked mildred opening her purse the woman would have been all politeness and good-nature without the stimulant offered by that open purse she had all the southern kindliness and alacrity to oblige but when the lady dropped half a dozen francs into her broad brown hand she almost sank to the earth in a rapture of gratitude madame shall see the house from garret to cellar if she wishes she exclaimed i know the old woman in charge she is as deaf as one of those stones yonder pointing to a block of blue-gray stone lying amidst the long rank grass upon the shelving ground between the road and the sea but if madame will permit i will show her the house madame is perhaps interested in the story of that poor lady who was murdered why do you say that she was murdered asked mildred indignantly you cannot know the woman shrugged her shoulders with a dubious air mais madame nobody but the good god can know but most of us thought that the englishman pushed his wife over the cliff they did not live happily together their cook was a cousin of mine a young woman who went regularly to confession and would not have spoken falsely for all the world and she told me there was great unhappiness between them the wife was often in tears the husband was often angry but he was never unkind your cousin must know that he was never unkind alas my cousin lies in the same burial ground yonder with the poor lady answered the woman pointing to the white crest of the hill above villefranche where the soldiers were being drilled in the dusty barrack yard under the cloudless blue she is no more here to tell the story but no she did not say the husband was unkind he was grave and sad he was not happy tears tears and reproaches and words from her day after day and from him silence and gloom poor people like us who work for our bread have no leisure for that kind of unhappiness i would rather stand over my casserole than sit in a salon and cry said my cousin it is cruel to say he caused her death when you know he was never unkind to her said mildred as they walked side by side a patient forbearing husband does not become a murderer all at once ah but continual dropping will wear a stone madame she may have tried him too much with her tears he went out of his mind after her death would he have gone mad do you think if he had not been guilty he was all the more likely to go mad knowing himself innocent and finding himself accused of a dreadful crime well i cannot tell i know most of us thought he had pushed her over the cliff i know the young man who was their gardener said if he had a wife with that kind of temper he would have thrown her down the well in his garden they were at the villa montfleury by this time a long low white house with a stone terrace overlooking the harbour of villefranche the woman opened the gate and mildred followed into the garden and to the terrace upon which the principal rooms opened there was a latticed veranda in front of the salon and dining-room over which roses and geraniums were trained and above which the purple bougainvillier spread its vivid bloom the orange trees grew thick in the orchard and in their midst stood the stone well down which the gardener said he would have thrown a discontented wife the caretaker was not in the house but all the doors were open mildred went from room to room the furniture was the same as it had been seventeen years ago the woman told mildred furniture of the period of the first empire shabby and with the air of a house that is let to strangers year after year and in which nobody takes any interest the clocks on the mantelpieces were all silent the vases were all empty everything had a dead look only the view from the windows was beautiful with an inexhaustible beauty mildred lingered in the faded salon looking at everything with a melancholy interest those two familiar figures were with her in the room she pictured them sitting there together yet so far apart in the bitter lack of sympathy a wife tormented by jealous suspicions no less agonizing because they were groundless a husband long-suffering weary with his little stock of marital love worn out under slow torture she could see them as they might have been in those bygone years george greswold's dark strong face younger than she had ever known it 
for when he first came to her father's house there had been threads of grey in his dark hair and premature lines upon the brow which told of corroding care she could understand now how those touches of grey had come into the thick wavy hair that clustered close on the broad strongly marked brow poor fay poor loving impulsive fay child as she had been in those old days in parchment street mildred had a vivid conception of her young companion's character she remembered the quick temper the sensitive self-esteem which had taken offence at the mere suggestion of slight she remembered dark hours of brooding melancholy when the girl had felt the sting of her isolated position had fancied herself a creature apart neglected and scorned by mrs fawcett and her butterfly visitors for mildred she had been always overflowing with love and she had never doubted the sincerity of mildred's affection but with all the rest of the household with every visitor who noticed her coldly or frankly ignored her she was on the alert for insult and offence remembering all this mildred could fully realize lady lochinvar's account of that unhappy union a woman so constituted would be satisfied with nothing less than a passionate all-absorbing love from the man she loved the rooms and the garden were haunted by those mournful shades two faces pale with pain she too had suffered those sharp stings of jealousy jealousy of a past love jealousy of the dead and she knew how keener than all common anguish is that agony of a woman's heart which yearns for a sovereign possession over past present and future in the life of the man she loves the market woman sat out in the sunshine on the terrace and waited while mildred roamed about the garden picturing that vanished life at every step there was the berceau the delight of a southern garden a long green alley arched with osiers over which the brown vine branches made a network open to the sunlight and the blue sky now while the vine was still leafless but in summer time a place of coolness and whispering leaves there was the fountain or the place where a fountain had once been and a stone bench beside it they had sat there perhaps on sunny mornings sat there and talked of their future full of hope they could not have been always unhappy fame must have had her bright hours and then no doubt she was dear to him full of a strange fascination a creature of quick wit and vivid imagination light and fire embodied in a fragile earthly tenement the sun was nearing the dark edge of the promontory when mildred left the garden the woman accompanying her waiting upon her footsteps sympathizing with her pensive mood with that instinctive politeness of the southern which is almost as great a delight to the stranger from the hard cold practical north as the colour of the southern sea or the ever varying beauty of the hills will you show me the place where the english lady fell over the cliff mildred asked and the woman went with her along the winding road and then upward to a path along the crest of a cliff a cliff that seemed low on account of those boulder heights which rose above it and which screened this eastward fronting shore of the little peninsula from all the world of the west the carriage road wound southward up to the higher ground but mildred and her guide followed a footpath which had been trodden on the long rank grass beside the cliff the rosemary bushes were full of flower pale cold grey blossoms as befitted the herb of death and a great yellow weed made patches of vivid colour among the blue-grey stones scattered in the long grass on the slope of the hill it is somewhere along this pathway madame said the woman i cannot tell you the exact spot some fisherman from beaulieu picked her up pointing across the blue water of the bay to a semicircle of yellow sand with a few white houses scattered along the curving road and some boats lying keel upward on the beach she never spoke again she was dead when they found her there did they see her fall no madame and yet people have dared to call her husband a murderer ah but madame it was the general opinion was it not his guilty conscience that drove him mad he came here once only after he left the madhouse wandered about the village for an hour or two went up to the cemetery and looked once but once only at the poor lady's grave and then drove away as if devils were hunting him who can doubt that it was his hand that sent her to her death no one would believe it who knew him everybody at st jean believed it even the people who liked him best mildred turned from her sick at heart she gave the woman some more money and then with briefest adieu walked back to the inn where she had left the carriage and where the horse was dozing with his nose in a bag of dried locust fruit while his driver sprawled half asleep upon the rough stone parapet between the inn and the bay pamela received her aunt graciously on her return to the hotel and seemed in better spirits than she had been since she left the palanza 
your lady lochinvar has written me the sweetest little note asking me to dine with her and go to the opera afterwards she said i feel sure this must be your doing aunt no dear i only told her that i had a very nice niece moping at the hotel and very tired of my dismal company tired of you no no aunt you know better than that i should no more grow tired of you than i should of box intending to make the most flattering comparison only he had made himself a part of our lives at palanza don't you know and one could not help missing him the pronoun meant castellani and not the dog i am glad i am going to the opera after all even if it does remind me of him and it's awfully kind of lady lochinvar to send her carriage for me i only waited to see you before i began to dress go dearest and take care to look your prettiest and you don't mind dining alone i shall be delighted to know you are enjoying yourself the prospect of an evening's solitude was an infinite relief to mildred she breathed more freely when pamela had gone dancing off to the lift a fluffy feathery mass of whiteness with hooded head and rosy face peeping from a border of white fox the tall door of the salon closed upon her with a solemn reverberation and mildred was alone with her own thoughts alone with the history of her husband's past life now that she had unravelled the tangled skein and knew all she was face to face with the past and how did it seem in her eyes was there no doubt no agonizing fear that the man she had loved as a husband might have slain the girl she had loved as a sister all those people those simple and disinterested villagers who had liked george ransom well enough for his own sake had yet believed him guilty they who had been on the spot and had had the best opportunities for judging the case rightly could she doubt him she who had seen honour and fine feeling in every act of his life she remembered the dream that terrible dream which had occurred at intervals sometimes once a year sometimes oftener that awe-inspiring dream which had shaken the dreamer's nerves as nothing but a vision of horror could have shaken them from which he had awakened more dead than alive completely unnerved cold drops upon his pallid brow his hands convulsed and icy his eyes glassy as death itself was it the dream of a murderer acting his crime over again in that dim world of sleep living over again the moment of his temptation and his fall no no another might so interpret the vision but not his wife i know him she repeated to herself passionately i know him i know his noble heart he is incapable of one cruel impulse he could not have done such a deed there is no possible state of feeling no moment of frenzy in which he would have been false to his character and his manhood and then she asked herself if fay had not been her sister if there had not been that insurmountable bar to her union with george greswold would her knowledge of his first wife's fate and the suspicion that had darkened his name have sufficed to part them could she knowing what she knew now knowing that he had been so suspected knowing that it was beyond his power even to prove his guiltlessness could she have gone through the rest of her life with him honouring him and trusting him as she had done in the years that were gone she told herself that she could have so trusted him that she could have honoured and loved him to the end pitying him for those dark experiences but with faith unshaken a murderer and a madman she said to herself repeating castellani's calumny murderer i would never believe him and shall i honour him less because that sensitive mind was plunged in darkness by the horror of his wife's fate pamela came home before midnight lady lochinvar had driven her to the door she was in high spirits and charmed with her ladyship and thought her lady's nephew mr stuart late of a famous highland regiment a rather agreeable person he is decidedly plain said pamela and looks about as intellectual as sir henry mountford and he evidently doesn't care a jot for music but he has very pleasant manners and he told me a lot about monte carlo a brother officer of his bronchial with a very nice wife came to lady lochinvar's box in the evening and she is going to call for me to-morrow afternoon to take me to the tennis ground at the cercle de la Méditerranée, if you don't mind my dearest you know i wish only to see you happy and with nice people i suppose this lady whose name you have not told me mrs murray she is very scotch but quite charming nothing fast or rowdy about her and devoted to her invalid husband he does not play tennis poor fellow but he sits in the sun and looks on which is very nice for him mrs murray made her appearance at two o'clock next day 
and mildred was pleased to find that pamela had not exaggerated her merits she was very scotch and talked of lady lochinvar as a purpose woman with a caledonian roll of the r in purpose which emphasized the word in its adjectival sense she had very pretty simple manners and was altogether the kind of young matron with whom a feather-headed girl might be trusted directly pamela and her new friend had departed mildred put on her bonnet and went out on foot she had made certain inquiries through albrecht and she knew the way she had to go upon the pilgrimage on which she was bent a pilgrimage of sorrowful memory there was a relief in being quite alone upon the long parade between the palm-trees and the sea and to know that she was free from notice and sympathy for the rest of the afternoon she walked to the place massena and there accepted the beseeching offers of one of the numerous flymen and took her seat in a light victoria behind a horse which looked a little better fed than his neighbours she told the man to drive along the west bank of the paillon on the road to st andre would not madame go to st andre and see the wonderful grotto and the petrifactions no madame did not wish to go so far as st andre she would tell the driver where to stop the horse rattled off at a brisk pace they are no crawlers those flies of the south they drove past the smart shops and hotels on the quay past the shabby old inn where the diligence put up a hostelry with suggestions of the past when the old italian town was not a winter rendezvous for all the nations the beaten track of yankee and cockney calico and counter jumper russian prince and hebrew capitalist millionaire and adventurer they drove past the shabby purlieus of the town workmen's lodging-houses sordid-looking shops then an orange garden here and there within crumbling plaster walls and here and there a tavern in a shabby garden to the left of the river on a sharp pinnacle of hill stood the monastery of simi with dome and tower dominating the landscape further away on the other side of the stony torrent bed rose the rugged chain of hills stretching away to mantone and the italian frontier and high up against the blue sky glimmered the white domes of the observatory they came by and by to a spot where by the side of the broad high road there was a wall enclosing a white dusty yard and behind it a long white house with many windows bare and barren staring blankly at the dry bed of the torrent and the rugged brown hills beyond at each end of the long white building there was a colonnade with iron bars open to the sun and the air and as mrs greswold's carriage drew near a man's voice rolled out the opening bars of ah che la morte in a tremendous baritone a cluster of idlers had congregated about the open gate to stare and listen for the great white house was a madhouse and the graded colonnades right and left of the long facade were the recreation grounds of the insane of those worst patients who could not be trusted to wander at their ease in the garden or to dig and delve upon the breezy hills towards st andre the singer was a fine-looking man dressed in loose garments of some white material and with long white gloves he flung himself on to an upper bar of the grating with the air of an athlete and hung upon the bars with his gloved hands facing that cluster of loafers as if they had been an audience in a theatre and singing with all the power of a herculean physique mildred told her driver to stop at the gate and she sat listening while the madman sang in fitful snatches of a few bars at a time but with never a false note that cage and the patients pacing up and down or hanging on to the bars or standing staring at the little crowd round the gate moved her to deepest pity touched her with keenest pain he had been here her beloved in that brief interval of darkest night she recalled how in one of his awakenings from that torturing dream he had spoken words of a strange meaning or of no meaning as they had seemed to her then the cage the cage again he had cried in an agonized voice iron bars like a wild beast these words had been an enigma to her then she saw the answer to the riddle here she sat for some time watching that sad spectacle hearing those broken snatches of song with intervals of silence or sometimes a wild peal of laughter the loiterers were full of speculations and assertions the porter at the gate answered some questions turned a deaf ear to others the singer was a spanish nobleman who had lost a fortune at monte carlo the night before and had been brought here bound hand and foot at early morning he had tried to kill himself and now he imagined himself a famous singer and that the barred colonnade was the stage of the grand opera at paris he'll soon be all right again said the porter with a careless shrug those violent cases mend quickly but he won't get his money back again poor devil 
said one of the loiterers a flyman whose vehicle was standing by the wall waiting for a customer hard to recover his senses and find himself without a son oh he has rich friends no doubt look at his white kid gloves he is young and handsome and he has a splendid voice somebody will take care of him do you see that old woman sitting over there in the garden you would not think there was anything amiss with her would you no more there is only she thinks she is the blessed virgin she has been here five-and-thirty years nobody pities her nobody inquires about her my father remembers her when she was a handsome young woman at a flower shop on the quai massina one of the merriest girls in nice somebody told her she was neglecting her soul and going to hell this set her thinking too much she used to be at the cathedral all day and at confession as often as the priest would hear her she neglected her shop and quarrelled with her mother and sisters she said she had a vocation and then one fine day she walked to the cathedral in a white veil with a bunch of lilies in her hand and she told all the people she met that they ought to kneel before her and make the sign of the cross for she was the mother of god three days afterwards her people brought her here she would neither eat nor drink and she never closed her eyes or left off talking about her glorious mission which was to work the redemption of all the women upon earth drive on to the doctor's house mildred said presently and the fly went on a few hundred yards and then drew up at the door of a private house which marked the boundary of the asylum garden mrs greswold had inquired the name of the doctor of longest experience in the asylum and she had been referred to m Leroy, the inhabitant of this house where the flyman informed her some of the more wealthy patients were lodged she had come prepared with a little note requesting the favour of an interview and enclosing her card with the address of enderby manor as well as her hotel in nice the english manor and the hotel westminster indicated at least respectability in the applicant and m leroy's reception was both prompt and courteous he was a clever-looking man about sixty years of age with a fine benevolent head and an attentive eye as of one always on the alert he had spent five-and-thirty of his sixty years in the society of the deranged and had devoted all his intellectual power to the study of mental disease after briefest preliminary courtesies mildred explained the purpose of her visit i am anxious to learn anything you can tell me about a patient who was under your care or at least in this establishment seventeen years ago and in whom i am deeply interested she said seventeen years is a long time madame but i have a good memory and i keep notes of all my cases i may be able to satisfy your curiosity in some measure what was the name of this patient he was an englishman called ransom george ransom he was placed here under peculiar circumstances corpo di bacco i should say they were peculiar very peculiar circumstances exclaimed the doctor do you know madame that mr ransom came here as a suspected murderer he came straight from the jail of villefranche where he had been detained on the suspicion of having killed his wife there was not one jot of evidence to support such a charge i know all the circumstances surely sir you who must have a wise knowledge of human nature did not think him guilty i hardly made up my mind upon that point even after i had seen him almost every day for six months but there is one thing i do know about this unhappy gentleman his lunacy was no assumption put on to save him from the consequences of a crime he was a man of noble intellect large brain power and for the time being his reason was totally obscured to what cause did you attribute the attack a long period of worry nerves completely shattered and finally the shock of that catastrophe on the cliff whether his hand pushed her to her death or the woman flung her life away the shock was too much for mr ransom's weakened and worried brain all the indications of his malady from the most violent stages to the gradual progress of recovery pointed to the same conclusion the history of the case revealed its cause and its earlier phases an unhappy marriage a jealous wife patience and forbearance on his part until patience degenerated into despair the dull apathy of a wearied intellect all that is easy to understand you pitied him then monsieur madame i pity all my patients but i found in mr ransom a man of exceptional characteristics and his case interested me deeply you would not have been interested had you believed him guilty 
pardon me madame crime is full of interest for the pathologist the idea that this gentleman might have spurned his wife from him in a moment of aberration would not have lessened my interest in his mental condition but although i have never made up my mind upon the question of his guilt or innocence i am bound to tell you since you seem even painfully interested in his history that his conduct after his recovery indicated an open and generous nature a mind of peculiar refinement and a great deal of chivalrous feeling i had many conversations with him during the period of returning reason and i formed a high opinion of his moral character did other people think him guilty the people he had known in nice for instance i fancy there were very few who thought much about him answered the doctor luckily for him and his belongings whoever they might be he had dropped out of society for some time before the catastrophe and he had never been a person of importance in nice he had not occupied a villa or given parties he lived with his wife at an hotel and the man who lives at an hotel counts for very little on the riviera he is only a casual visitor who may come and go as he pleases his movements unless he has rank or fashion or inordinate wealth to recommend him excite no interest he is not a personage hence there was very little talk about the lamentable end of mr ransom's married life there were hardly half a dozen paragraphs in our local papers all told and i doubt if those were quoted in the figaro or galignani my patient might congratulate himself upon his obscurity did no one from england visit him during his confinement here no one the local authorities looked after his interests so far as to take care of the ready money which was found in his house and which sufficed to pay for the poor lady's funeral and for my patient's expenses leaving a balance to be handed over to him on his recovery from the hour he left these gates i never heard from him or of him again but every new year has brought me an anonymous gift from london such a gift as only a person of refined taste would choose and i have attributed those annual greetings to mr george ransom it would be only like him to remember past kindness you know him well madame very well so well as to be able to answer with my life for his being incapable of the crime of which even you who saw so much of him hesitate to acquit him it is my misfortune madame to have seen the darker sides of the human mind and to know that in the whitest life there may be one black spot one moment of sin which stultifies a lifetime of virtue however it is possible that your judgment is right in this particular case be assured i should be glad to think so and glad to know that mr ransom's after days have been all sunshine a sigh was mildred's only answer m leroy saw tears in her eyes and asked no more he was shrewd enough to guess her connection with his former patient a second wife no doubt no one but a wife would be so intensely interested is there anything i can do for you or for my old patient he began seeing that his visitor lingered oh no there is nothing except if you would let me see the rooms in which he lived assuredly it is a melancholy pleasure at best to recall the sorrows we have outlived but the association will be less painful in your case since the friend in whom you are interested was so speedily and so thoroughly restored to mental health i take it that he has never had a relapse never thank god it was not likely from the history of the case he led the way across the vestibule and upstairs to the second floor where he showed mrs greswold two airy rooms sitting-room and bedroom communicating overlooking the valley towards simi with the white-walled convent on the crest of the hill and the white temples of the dead clustering near it cross and column athenian pediment and italian cupola dazzling white against the cloudless blue the rooms were neatly furnished and there was every appearance of comfort no suggestion of bedlam padded walls or straight waistcoats had he these rooms all the time asked mildred not all the time he was somewhat difficult to deal with during the first few weeks and he was in the main building under the care of one of my subordinates till improvement began by that time i had grown interested in his case and took him into my own house pray let me see the rooms he occupied at first monsieur i want to know all i want to be able to understand what his life was like in that dark dream she knew now what his own dream meant m leroy indulged her whim he took her across the dusty garden to the great white house 
a house of many windows and long corridors airy bare hopeless-looking as it seemed to that sad visitor she saw the two iron-barred enclosures and the restless creatures roaming about them clinging to the bars climbing like monkeys from perch to perch hanging from the trapeze the spaniard had left off singing she was shown george ransom's room which was empty the bare whitewashed walls chilled her as if she had gone into an ice vault here on everything there was the stamp of a state prison iron bars white walls a deadly monotony she was glad to escape into the open air again but not until she had knelt for some minutes beside the narrow bed upon which george ransom had lain seventeen years ago and thanked god for his restoration of reason and prayed that his declining days might be blessed she prayed for him to whom she might never more be the source of happiness she who until so lately had been his nearest and dearest upon earth a law which she recognized as duty had risen up between them and both must go down to the grave in sadness rather than that law should be broken End of chapter nine book two chapter ten of the fatal three by mary elizabeth braddon this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter ten a wrecked life m leroy was interested in his visitor and in no wise hastened her departure he led her through the garden of the asylum anxious that she should see that sad life of the shattered mind in its milder aspect the quieter patients were allowed to amuse themselves at liberty in the garden and here mildred saw the woman who fancied herself the blessed virgin and who sat apart from the rest with a crown of withered anemones upon her iron-gray locks the doctor stooped to talk to her in the niçois language describing her hallucination to mildred in his broken english between whiles she is one of my oldest cases and mild as a lamb he said she is what superstition had made her she might have been a happy wife and mother but for that fatal influence ah here comes a lady of a very different temper and not half so easy a subject a woman of about sixty advanced towards them along the dusty gravel path between the trampled grass and the dust whitened orange trees a woman who carried her head and shoulders with the pride of an empress and who looked about her with defiant eyes fanning herself with a large japanese paper fan as she came along a fan of vivid scarlet and cheap gilt paper which seemed to intensify the brightness of her great black eyes as she waved it to and fro before her haggard face a woman who must have once been beautiful would you believe that lady was prima donna at la scala nearly forty years ago asked the doctor as he and mildred stood beside the path watching that strange figure with its theatrical dignity the massive plaits of grizzled black hair were wound coronet-wise about the woman's head her rusty black velvet gown trailed in the dust threadbare long ago almost in tatters to-day a gown of a strange fashion which had been worn upon the stage leonora's or lucretia's gown perhaps once upon a time at sight of the physician she stopped suddenly and made him a sweeping curtsey with all the exaggerated grace of the theatre do you know if they open this month at the scala she asked in italian indeed my dear i have heard nothing of their doings they might have begun their season with the new year she said with a dictatorial air they always did in my time of course you know that they have tried to engage me again they wanted me for amina but i had to remind them that i am not a light soprano when i reappear it shall be as lucretia borgia there i stand on my own ground no one can touch me there she sang the opening bars of lucretia's first senna the once glorious voice was rough and discordant but there was power in the tones even yet and real dramatic fire in the midst of exaggeration suddenly while she was singing she caught the expression of mildred's face watching her and she stopped at a breath and grasped the stranger by both hands with an excited air that moves you does it not she exclaimed you have a soul for music i can see that in your face i should like to know more of you come and see me whenever you like and i will sing to you the doctor lets me use his piano sometimes when he is in a good humour say rather when you are reasonable my good maria said m leroy laying a fatherly hand on her shoulder there are days when you are not to be trusted i am to be trusted to-day let me come to your room and sing to her 
pointing to mildred with her fan i like her face she has the eyes and lips that console her husband is lucky to have such a wife let me sing to her i want her to understand what kind of woman i am would it bore you too much to indulge her madame asked the doctor in an undertone she is a strange creature and it will wound her if you refuse she does not often take a fancy to any one but she frequently takes dislikes and those are violent i shall be very happy to hear her answered mildred i am in no hurry to return to nice the doctor led the way back to his house the singer talking to mildred with an excited air as they went talking of the day when she was first soprano at milan everybody envied me my success she said there were those who said i owed everything to him that he made my voice and my style lies madame black and bitter lies i won all the prizes at the conservatoire he was one master among many i owed him nothing 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 she reiterated the word with acrid emphasis and an angry furl of her fan and now you are beginning the old strain said the doctor with a good-humoured shrug of his shoulders if this goes on there shall be no piano for you to-day i will have no grievances grievances are the bane of social intercourse if you come to my salon it must be to sing not to reopen old sores we all have our wounds as well as you signorina but we keep them covered up i am dumb said the singer meekly they went into the doctor's private room three sides of the room were lined with books chiefly of a professional or scientific character a cottage piano stood in a recess by the fireplace the woman flew to the instrument with a rapturous eagerness and began to play her hands were faintly tremulous with excitement but her touch was that of a master as she played the symphony to the finale of la cenarantola has she no piano in her own room asked mildred in a whisper no poor soul she is one of our pauper patients the state provides for her but it does not give her a private room or a piano i let her come here two or three times a week for an hour or so when she is reasonable mildred wondered if it would be possible for her as a stranger to provide a room and a piano for this friendless enthusiast she would have been glad out of her abundance to have lightened a suffering sister's fate and she determined to make the proposition to the doctor the singer played snatches of familiar music rossini donizetti bellini operatic airs which mildred knew by heart she wandered from one sena to another and her voice though it had lost its sweetness and sustaining power was still brilliantly flexible she sang with a rapturous unconsciousness of her audience mildred and the doctor sitting quietly at each side of the hearth where a single pine log smouldered on the iron dogs above a heap of white ashes presently the music changed to a gayer lighter strain and she began an airy cavatina all coquetry and grace that joyous melody was curiously familiar to mildred's ear where did i hear that music she said aloud it seems as if it were only the other day and yet it is nearly two years since i was at the opera the singer left the cavatina unfinished and wandered into another melody ah i know now exclaimed mildred that is paolo castellani's music the woman started up from the piano as if the name had wounded her paolo castellani she cried what do you know of paolo castellani dr leroy went over to her and laid his hand upon her shoulder heavily now we are in for a scene he muttered to mildred you have mentioned a most unlucky name what has she to do with signor castellani he was her cousin he trained her for the stage and she was the original in several of his operas she was his slave his creature and lived only to please him i suppose she expected him to marry her poor soul but he knew better than that he contrived to fascinate a french girl a consumptive who was travelling in italy for her health with a wealthy father he married the frenchwoman and i believe that marriage broke maria's heart the singer had seated herself at the piano again and was playing with rapid and brilliant finger running up and down the keys in wild excitement mildred and the physician were standing by the window talking in lowered voices unheeded by maria castellani was it that event which wrecked her mind asked mildred deeply interested no it was some years afterwards that her brain gave way she had a brilliant career before her at the time of castellani's desertion and she bore the blow with the courage of a roman 
so long as her voice lasted and the public were constant to her she contrived to bear up against that burning sense of wrong which has been the distinguishing note of her mind ever since she came here but the first breath of failure froze her she felt her voice decaying while she was comparatively a young woman her glass told her that she was losing her beauty that she was beginning to look old and haggard her managers told her more they gave her the cold shoulder and put newer singers above her head then despair took hold of her she became gloomy and irritable difficult and capricious in her dealings with her fellow artists and then came the end and she was brought here she had saved no money she had been reckless even beyond the habits of her profession she was friendless there was nobody interested in her fate not even signor castellani castellani paolo castellani pussy bet the man was a compound of selfishness and treachery she was not likely to get pity from him the very fact that he had used her badly made her loathsome to him i doubt if he ever inquired what became of her if any one had asked him about her he would have said that she had dropped through a worn-out voice a faded beauty que voulez-vous she had no other friends no ties none she was an orphan at twelve years old without a sou castellani paid for her education and traded on her talent he trained her to sing in his own operas and in that light fanciful music she was at her best though it is her delusion now that she excelled in the grand style i believe he absorbed the greater part of her earnings until they quarrelled some time after his marriage there was a kind of reconciliation between them she appeared in a new opera his last and worst her voice was going his talent had begun to fail it was the beginning of the end has signor castellani's son shown no interest in this poor creature's fate no the son lives in england i believe for the most part i doubt if he knows anything about maria the singer had reverted to that familiar music she sang the first part of an aria a melody disguised with overmuch fioritura light graceful unmeaning that is in his last opera she said rising from the piano with a more rational air the opera was almost a failure but i was applauded to the echo his genius had forsaken him follies follies falsehoods crimes he could not be true to any one or anything he was as false to his wife as he had been false to me and to his proud young english signorina ah well who can doubt that he lied to her she fell into a meditative mood standing by the piano touching a note now and then young and handsome and rich would she have accepted degradation with open eyes no 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 he lied to her as he had lied to me he was made up of lies her eyes grew troubled and her lips worked convulsively again the doctor laid his strong broad hand upon her shoulder come maria he said in italian enough for to-day madame has been pleased with your singing yes indeed signora you have a noble voice i should be very glad if i could do anything to be of use to you if i could contribute to your comfort in any way oh maria is happy enough with us i hope said the doctor cheerily we are all fond of her when she is reasonable but it is time she went to her dinner arrivederci signora maria accepted her dismissal with a good grace saluted mildred and the doctor with her stage curtsy and withdrew one side of m leroy's house opened into the garden the other into a courtyard adjoining the high road poor soul i should be so glad to pay for a piano and a private sitting-room for her if i might be allowed to do so said mildred when the singer was gone you are too generous madame but i doubt if it would be good for her to accept your bounty she enjoys the occasional use of my piano intensely if she had one always at her command she would give up her life to music which exercises too strong an influence upon her disordered brain to be indulged in at libitum nor would a private apartment be an advantage in her case she is too much given to brooding over past griefs and the society of her fellow sufferers the friction and movement of the public life are good for her what did she mean by her talk of an english girl some story of wrong-doing was it all imaginary i believe there was some scandal at milan some flirtation or possibly an intrigue between castellani and one of his english pupils but i never heard the details maria's jealousy would be likely to exaggerate the circumstances for i believe she adored her cousin to the last 
long after she knew that he had never cared for her except as an element in his success mildred took leave of the doctor after thanking him for his politeness she left a handful of gold for the benefit of the poor patients and left dr leroy under the impression that she was one of the sweetest women he had ever met her pensive beauty her low and musical voice the clear and resolute purpose of every word and look were in his mind indications of the perfection of womanhood it is not often that nature achieves such excellence mused the doctor it is a pity that perfection should be short-lived yet i cannot prognosticate length of years for this lady pamela's spirits were decidedly improving she talked all dinner-time and gave a graphic description of her afternoon in the tennis-court behind the cercle de la Méditerranée. i am to see the club-house some morning before the members begin to arrive she said it is a perfectly charming club there is a theatre which serves as a ballroom on grand occasions there is to be a dance next week and lady lochinvar will chaperon me if you don't mind i shall be most grateful to lady lochinvar dear believe me if i am a hermit i don't want to keep you in melancholy seclusion i am very glad for you to have pleasant friends mrs murray is delightful she begged me to call her jessie she is going to take me for a drive before lunch to-morrow and we are to do some shopping in the afternoon the shops here are simply lovely almost as nice as brighton better they have more chic and i am told they are twice as dear was mr stuart at the tennis court yes he plays there every afternoon when he is not at monte carlo that does not sound like a very useful existence perhaps you will say he is an adventurer exclaimed pamela with a flash of temper and then repenting in a moment she added i beg your pardon aunt but you are really wrong about mr stuart he looks after lady lochinvar's estate he is invaluable to her but he cannot do much for the estate when he is playing tennis here or gambling at monte carlo oh but he does he answers no end of letters every morning lady lochinvar says he is a most wonderful young man he attends to her house accounts here i am afraid she would be very extravagant if she were not well looked after she has no idea of business mr stuart has even to manage her dressmakers then one may suppose he is really useful even at nice has he any means of his own or is he entirely dependent on his aunt oh he has an income of his own a modest income mrs murray says hardly enough for him to get along easily in a cavalry regiment but quite enough for him as a civilian and his aunt will leave him everything his expectations are splendid well pamela i will not call him an adventurer and i shall be pleased to make his acquaintance if he will call upon me he is dying to know you may mrs murray bring him to tea to-morrow afternoon with pleasure end of chapter ten end of book two book three chapter one of the fatal three by mary elizabeth braddon this librivox recording is in the public domain book three atropos or that which must be chapter one in the morning of life george greswold succumbed to fate he had done all he could in the way of resistance he had appealed against his wife's decision he had set love against principle or prejudice and principle as mildred understood it had been too strong for love so there was nothing left for the forsaken husband but submission he went back to the home in which he had once been happy and he sat down amidst the ruins of his domestic life he sat by his desolate hearth through the long dull wintry months and he made no effort to bring brightness or variety into his existence he made no stand against unmerited misfortune i am too old to forget he told himself that lesson can only be learnt in youth a young man might have gone out as a wanderer might have sought excitement and distraction amidst strange cities and strange races of men might have found forgetfulness in danger and hardship the perils of unexplored deserts the hazards of untrodden mountains the hairbreadth escapes of savage life pestilence famine warfare george greswold felt no inclination for any such adventure the mainspring of life had snapped and he admitted to himself that he was a broken man he sat by the hearth in his gloomy library day after day and night after night until the small hours sometimes he took his gun in the early morning and went out with a leash of dogs for an hour or two of solitary shooting among his own covers 
he tramped his copses in all weathers and at all hours but he rarely went outside his own domain nor did he ever visit his cottagers or a small tenantry with whom he had been once so familiar a friend all interest in his estate had gone from him after his daughter's death he left everything to the new steward who was happily both competent and honest his books were his only friends those studious habits acquired years before when he was comparatively a poor man stood by him now his one distraction his only solace was found in the contents of those capacious bookshelves three-fourths of which were filled with volumes of his own selection the gradual accumulation of his sixteen years of ownership his grandfather's library which constituted the remaining fourth consisted of those admirable standard works in the largest possible number of volumes which formed an item in the furniture of respectable houses during the last century and which from the stiffness of their bindings and the unblemished appearance of their paper and print would seem to have enjoyed an existence of dignified retirement from the day they left the bookseller's shop but for those long tramps in the wintry copses where holly and ivy showed brightly green amidst leafless chestnuts and hazels but for those communings with the intellect of past and present in the long still winter evenings george greswold's brain must have given way under the burden of an undeserved sorrow as it was he contrived to live on peacefully and even with an air of contentment his servants surprised him in no paroxysm of grief he startled them with no strange exclamations his manner gave no cause for alarm he accepted his lot in silence and submission his days were ordered with a simple regularity so far as the service of the house went his valet and butler agreed that he was in all things an admirable master the idea in the household was that mrs greswold had taken to religion that seemed the only possible explanation for a parting which had been preceded by no domestic storms for which there was no apparent cause in the conduct of the husband that idea of the wife having discovered an intrigue of her husband's which louisa had discussed in the housekeeper's room at brighton was no longer entertained in the servants hall at enderby if there had been anything of that kind something would have come out by this time said the butler who had a profound belief in the ultimate coming out of all social mysteries george greswold was not kept in ignorance of his wife's movements pamela had been shrewd enough to divine that her uncle would be glad to hear from her in order to hear of mildred and she had written to him from time to time giving him a graphic account of her own and her aunt's existence there had been only one suppression the young lady had not once alluded to castellani's share in their winter life at palenza she had a horror of arousing that dragon of suspicion which she knew to lurk in the minds of all uncles with reference to all agreeable young men george greswold had not heard from his niece for more than a fortnight when there came a letter written the day after mildred's visit to the madhouse and full of praises of lady lochinvar and the climate of nice that letter was the greatest shock that greswold had received since his wife had left him for it told him that she was in a place where she could scarcely fail to discover all the details of his wretched story he had kept it locked from her he had shut himself behind a wall of iron he had kept a silence as of the grave and now she from whom he had prayed that his fatal story might be for ever hidden was certain to learn the worst aunt went to lunch with lady lochinvar the day after our arrival wrote pamela she spent a long morning with her and then went for a drive somewhere in the environs and was out till nearly dinner-time she looked so white and fagged when she came back poor dear and i am sure she had done too much for one day lady lochinvar asked me to dinner and took me to the new opera house which is lovely her nephew was with us rather plain and with no taste for music he said he preferred madame angot to lohengrin but enormously clever i am told in a solid practical kind of way und so weiter for three more pages mildred had been with lady lochinvar with lady lochinvar who knew all who had seen him and his wife together had received them both as her friends had been confided in he knew by that fond jealous wife made the recipient of tearful doubts and hysterical accusations vivian had owned as much to him she had been with lady lochinvar who must know the history of his wife's death and the dreadful charge brought against him who must know that he had been an inmate at the great white barrack on the road to st andre who in all probability thought him guilty of murder all the barriers had fallen now all the floodgates had opened he saw himself hateful monstrous inhuman in the eyes of the woman he adored 
she loved her sister with an inextinguishable love he thought and she sees me now as her sister's murderer the cold-blooded cruel husband who made his wife's existence miserable and ended by killing her in a paroxysm of brutal rage that is the kind of monster i must seem in my mildred's eyes she will look back upon my stubborn silence my gloomy reserve and she will see all the indications of guilt my own conduct will condemn me as he sat by a solitary hearth in the cold march evening the large reading lamp making a circle of light amidst the gloom george greswold's mind travelled over the days of his youth and the period of that fatal marriage which had blighted him in the morning of his life which blighted him now in life's meridian when but for this dark influence all the elements of happiness were in his hand he looked back to the morning of life and saw himself full of ambitious plans and aspiring dreams well content to be the younger son to whom it was given to make his own position in the world scorning the idle days of a fox-hunting squire resolute to become an influence for good among his fellow-men he had never envied his brother the inheritance of the soil he had thought but little of his own promised inheritance of enderby unhappily that question of the succession to the enderby estate had been a sore point with squire ransom he adored his elder son who was like him in character and person and he cared very little for george whom he considered a bookish and unsympathetic individual a young man who hardly cared whether there were few or many foxes in the district whether the young partridges throve or perished by foul weather or epidemic disease a young man who took no interest in the things that filled the lives of other people in a word george was not a sportsman and that deficiency made him an alien to his father's race there had never been a ransom who was not sporting to the core of his heart until the appearance of this pragmatical oxonian without being in any manner scientific or a student of evolution mr ransom had a fixed belief in heredity it was the duty of the son to resemble the father and a son who was in all his tastes and inclinations a distinct variety stamped himself as undutiful i don't suppose the fellow can help it said mr ransom testily but there's hardly a remark he makes which doesn't act upon my nerves like a nutmeg grater nobody would have given the squire credit for possessing very sensitive nerves but everybody knew he had a temper and a temper which occasionally showed itself in violent outbreaks the kind of temper which will dismiss a household at one fell swoop send a stud of horses to tattersalls on the spur of the moment tear up a lease on the point of signature or turn a son out of doors the knowledge that this unsportsmanlike son of his would inherit the fine estate of enderby was a constant source of vexation to squire ransom of mapledown the dream of his life was that mapledown and enderby should be united in the possession of his son randolph the two properties would have made randolph rich enough to hope for a peerage and that idea of a possible peerage dazzled the tory squire his family had done the state some service had sat for important boroughs had squandered much money upon contested elections had been staunch in times of change and difficulty there was no reason why a ransom should not ascend to the upper house in these days when peerages are bestowed so much more freely than in the time of pitt and fox the two estates would have made an important property under one ownership divided they were only respectable and what the squire most keenly felt was the fact that enderby was by far the finer property and that his younger son must ultimately be a much richer man than his brother the sussex estate had dwindled considerably in those glorious days of contested elections and party feeling the hampshire estate was intact mr ransom could not forgive his wife for her determination that the younger son should be her heir he always shuffled uneasily upon his seat in the old family pew when the twenty-seventh chapter of genesis was read in the sunday morning service he compared his wife to rebecca he asked the vicar at luncheon on one of those sundays what he thought of the conduct of rebecca and jacob in that very shady transaction and the vicar replied in the orthodox fashion favouring jacob just as rebecca had favoured him i can't understand it exclaimed the squire testily the whole business is against my idea of honour and honesty i wouldn't have such a fellow as jacob for my steward if he were the cleverest man in sussex and look you here vicar if jacob was right and knew he was right why the deuce was he so frightened the first time he met esau after that ugly business take my word for it jacob was a sneak and providence punished him rightly with a desolate old age and a quarrelsome family the vicar looked down at his plate sighed gently and held his peace 
the time came when the growing feeling of aversion on the father's part showed itself in outrage and insult which the son could not endure george remonstrated against certain acts of injustice in the management of the estate he pleaded the cause of tenant against landlord a dire offence in the eyes of the tory squire there came an open rupture and it was impossible for the younger son to remain any longer under the father's roof his mother loved him devotedly but she felt that it was better for him to go and so it was settled in loving consultation between mother and son that he should carry out a long-cherished wish of his oxford days and explore all that was historical and interesting in southern europe seeing men and cities in a leisurely way and devoting himself to literature in the meantime he had already written for some of the high-class magazines and he felt that it was in him to do well as a writer of the serious order critic essayist and thinker his mother gave him three hundred a year which for a young man of his simple habits was ample he told himself that he should be able to earn as much again by his pen and so after a farewell of decent friendliness to his father and his brother randolph and tenderest parting with his mother he set out upon his pilgrimage a free agent with the world all before him he explored greece dwelling fondly upon all the old traditions the old histories he made the acquaintance of dr schliemann and entered heart and soul into that gentleman's views this occupied him more than a year for those scenes exercised a potent fascination upon a mind to which greek literature was a supreme delight he spent a month at constantinople and a winter in corfu and cyprus he devoted a summer to switzerland and did a little mountaineering and during all his wanderings he contrived to give a considerable portion of his time to literature it was after his swiss travels that he went to italy and established himself in florence for a quiet winter he hired an apartment on a fourth floor of a palace overlooking the arno and here for the first time since he had left england he went a little into general society his mother had sent him letters of introduction to old friends of her own english and florentine he was young handsome and a gentleman and he was received with enthusiasm had he been fond of society he might have been at parties every night but he was fonder of books and of solitude and he took very little advantage of people's friendliness the few houses to which he went were houses famous for good music and it was in one of these houses that he met vivian faux it was in the midst of a symphony by beethoven while he was standing at the edge of the crowd which surrounded the open space given to the instrumentalists that he first saw the woman who was to be his wife she was sitting in the recess of a lofty window quite apart from the throng a pale dark-eyed girl with roughened hair carelessly heaped above her low broad forehead her slender figure and sloping shoulders showed to advantage in a low-necked black gown without a vestige of ornament she wore neither jewels nor flowers at an assembly where gems were sparkling and flowers breathing sweetness upon every feminine bosom her thin white arms hung loosely in her lap her back was turned to the performers and her eyes were averted from the crowd she looked the image of ennui and indifference he found his hostess directly the symphony was over and asked her to introduce him to the young lady in black velvet yonder sitting alone in the window have you been struck by miss faux's rather singular appearance asked signora vicenti she is not so handsome as many young ladies who are here to-night no she is not handsome but her face interests me she looks as if she had suffered some great disappointment i believe her whole life has been a disappointment she is an orphan and as far as i can ascertain a friendless orphan she has good means but there is a mystery about her position which places her in a manner apart from other girls of her age she has no relations to whom to refer no family home to which to return she is here with some rather foolish people an english artist and his wife who cannot do very much for her and i believe she keenly feels her isolation it makes her bitter against other girls and she loses friends as fast as she makes them people won't put up with her tongue well mr ansom do you change your mind after that on the contrary i feel so much the more interested in the young lady ah your interest will not last however i shall be charmed to introduce you they went across the room to that distant recess where miss faux was still seated her hair and attitude unchanged since george ransom first observed her she started with a little look of surprise when signora vicenti and her companion approached but she accepted the introduction with a nonchalant air and she replied to ransom's opening remarks with manifest indifference then by degrees she grew more animated and talked about the people in the room ridiculing their pretensions their eccentricities their costume you are not an habitue here 
she asked i don't remember seeing you before to-night no it is the first of signora vicenti's parties that i have seen then i conclude it will be the last why oh no sensible person would come a second time the music is tolerable if one could hear it anywhere else but the people are odious yet i conclude this is not your first evening here no i come every week i have nothing else to do with myself but to go about to houses i hate and mix with people who hate me why should they hate you oh we all hate each other and want to overreach one another envy and malice are in the air picture to yourself fifty manoeuvring mothers with a hundred marriageable daughters most of them portionless and about twenty eligible men think how ferocious the competition must be but you are independent of all that you are outside the arena yes i have nothing to do with their slave market but they hate me all the same perhaps because i have a little more money than most of them perhaps because i am nobody a waif and stray able to give no account of my existence she spoke of her position with a reckless candour that shocked him there is something to bear in every lot he said trying to be philosophical i suppose so but i only care about my own burden please don't pretend that you do either i should despise a man who pretended not to be selfish do you think that all men are selfish i have never seen any evidence to the contrary the man i thought the noblest and the best did me the greatest wrong it was possible to do me in order to spare himself trouble ransom was silent he would not enter into the discussion of a past history of which he was ignorant and which was doubtless full of pain after this he met her very often and while other young men avoided her on account of her bitter tongue he showed a preference for her society and encouraged her to confide in him she went everywhere chaperoned by mr mortimer a dreary twaddler who was for ever expounding theories of art which he had picked up parrot-wise in a london art school thirty years before his latest ideas were coeval with maclise and mulready mrs mortimer was by way of being an invalid and sat and nursed her neuralgia at home while her husband and miss foe went into society it was at the beginning of spring that an american lady of wealth and standing invited the mortimers and their protege to a picnic to which mr ransom was also bidden and it was this picnic which sealed george ransom's fate pity for vivian's lonely position had grown into a sincere regard he had discovered warm feelings under that cynical manner a heart capable of a profound affection she had talked to him of a child a kind of adopted sister whom she had passionately loved and from whom she had been parted by the selfish cruelty of the little girl's parents my school life in england had soured me before then she said and i was not a very amiable person even at fifteen years old but that cruelty finished me i have hated my fellow-creatures ever since he pleaded against this wholesale condemnation you were unlucky he said in encountering unworthy people ah but one of those people the child's father had seemed to me the best of men i had believed in him as second only to god in benevolence and generosity when he failed i renounced my belief in human goodness unawares george ransom had fallen into the position of her confidant and friend from friendship to love was an easy transition and a few words spoken at random during a ramble on an olive-clad hill bound him to her for ever those unpremeditated words loosed the fountain of tears and he saw the most scornful of women the women who affected an absolute aversion for his sex and a contempt for those weaker sisters who waste their love upon such vile clay he saw her abandon herself to a passion of tears at the first word of affection which he had ever addressed to her he had spoken as a friend rather than as a lover but those tears bound him to her for life he put his arm round her and pillowed the small pale face upon his breast the dark impassioned eyes looking up at him drowned in tears you should not have said those words she sobbed you cannot understand what it is to have lived as i have lived a creature apart unloved unvalued oh is it true do you really care for me with all my heart he answered and in good faith his profound compassion took the place of love and in that moment he believed that he loved her as a man should love the woman whom he chooses for his wife they were married within a month from that march afternoon and for some time their married life was happy he wished to take her to england but she implored him to abandon that idea in england everybody would want to know who i am she said i should be tortured by questions about my people abroad society is less exacting 
he deferred to her in this as he would have done in any other matter which involved her happiness they spent the first half year of their married life in desultory wanderings in the oberland and the engadine and then settled at nice for the winter here mrs ransome met lady lochinvar whom she had known at florence and was at once invited to the palais montano and here for the first time appeared those clouds which were too soon to darken george ransome's domestic horizon there were many beautiful women at nice that winter handsome irish girls vivacious americans french women and english women and among so many who were charming there were some whom george ransome did not scruple to admire with as much frankness as he would have admired a face by guidot or raphael he was slow to perceive his wife's distrust could hardly bring himself to believe that she could be jealous of him but he was not suffered to remain long in this happy ignorance a hysterical outburst one night after their return from a ball at the club-house opened the husband's eyes the demon of jealousy stood revealed and from that hour the angel of domestic peace was banished from george ransome's hearth he struggled against that evil influence he exercised patience common sense forbearance but in vain there were lulls in the storm sometimes delusive calms and he hoped the demon was exorcised and then came a worse outbreak more hysterics despairing self-abandonment threats of suicide he bore it as long as he could and ultimately his wife's health offering an excuse for such a step he proposed that they should leave nice and take a villa in the environs in some quiet spot where they might live apart from all society vivian accepted the proposition with rapture she flung herself at her husband's feet and covered his hands with tearful kisses oh if i could but believe that you still love me that you are not weary of me she exclaimed i should be the happiest woman in the universe they spent a week of halcyon peace driving about in quest of their new home they explored the villages within ten miles of nice they breakfasted at village restaurants in the sunny march noontide and finally they settled upon a villa at st jean within an hour's drive of the great white city and to this new home they went at the end of the month after bidding adieu to their friends in nice End of chapter one